Well, one thing that it tells you is there is clearly wiring in the brain that is related to onset of craving um, in response to environmental stimuli. So, uh, you know, on one hand, I mean, one of the most basic tenets of recovery is environment is very important. I mean, environment is very important in recovery. I mean, if you go back to the same spots where um, you have used drugs or alcohol, pornography, etc., in the past, it increases your chances of relapse by a lot. And studies like that begin to show why, because because there is such a heavy wiring in the brain that responds to cues that have environmental, sensory cues that have been associated with drug usage in the past. So that, you know, that alone is important because it gives you a very biological um, understanding of stuff that goes on in your brain that is related to environment, that is very related to staying in recovery, don't be around those kinds of cues, certainly when you're in the early stages, when you're vulnerable. And yes, the brain signal does is more intense early on. It, it, it actually lasts longer than it would be nice if it didn't last as long. So it's not like it completely goes away very quickly. Um, and, and, and actually, the time course of it, I don't think, has been studied very closely. But it's certainly true that in the early weeks and months, there's a very intense uh, effect of these kinds of sensory cues and then that makes it very easy to understand why being sensitive to what environment you're in is extremely important for the arising of craving and 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 your brain circuitry having these very intense responses okay so that's that's one thing that's very you know that's straightforward that's obvious but there are other factors that come up when you think about a study like that because um the, the issue of vulnerability and genetic vulnerability also has aspects of understanding a study like that because in OCD, where it's been better studied in terms of that area of the brain with respect to genetics, genetics and pathology, it's actually pretty well known now that for obsessive compulsive disorder, that area of the brain and related areas of the brain don't work exactly right um, for genetically inherited reasons and even have differences in the relatives of people um, who have the condition, even if the relatives don't have any symptoms. So that really shows that that area of the brain really does have a vulnerability to inherited factors. And for alcohol, for instance, um, I don't believe that particular area of the brain has been studied um, yet in relatives of alcoholics, but for all I know it has been because research goes on very, you know, very intensely and, and, and I don't keep up on all the brain imaging stuff in substance abuse literature. But, but years ago, um, it's been well recognized that the relatives of people who have alcoholism respond quite different, metabolize alcohol differently, have different physiological responses to alcohol, even if they're not alcoholic at all, even if they've never had a problem with alcohol, even if they can actually drink without having problems drinking. Um, the relatives of people who have alcoholism have a difference in response. They have a more, they're more sensitized in certain aspects of their brain responses to alcohol. So, so this issue of genetic um, vulnerability and the fact that genetic vulnerability will manifest itself in how your brain works and, and understanding that all these numerous factors, many of which are kind of beyond your just here and now present existence, um, have, have a lot of influences on how your brain responds to things and those brain responses are related to how cravings arise. And that is why this issue of impartial spectator, meta-awareness, mindful awareness, metacognition. Metacognition means basically thinking about your thinking. Meta-awareness means being aware of what you're aware of. And um, impartial spectator means having a perspective as if you were watching yourself.
um, a, a, a rational outsider's perspective on your own inner life, as if you could read your own mind sometimes, people say, or standing outside of yourself and seeing what's going on inside of you, but with a perspective that gives some distance, not necessarily intense emotional distance, but just some separateness so that you can know what's going on in your own mind without being intensely um, involved, that you could have uh, a, a rational um, perspective on it, um, make uh, neutral or discrimin discriminate what's going on in there without having harsh criticism of it or without jumping to conclusions about it. But knowing what's there and making judgments about the goodness, the wholesomeness, the unwholesomeness, the, 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 the adaptiveness, the maladaptiveness of it. In some ways, using the impartial spectator is very much a version of being a good therapist for yourself. Being your own good therapist is what your impartial spectator does for you. And so when you combine these numbers of factors, you can see that if you know that environment has a r radical influence on how centers of the brain involved in the arising of craving um, work, and you can know that there's a genetic element to that, and most people who run into serious substance abuse problems do have some genetic vulnerability, um, you, those two factors, you can begin to use your impartial spectator to start making more wise judgments about how to process the way you live your life so that you take those things into account. And especially that's true at the point when you're saying to yourself, my brain responds differently to these places, these things, um, these substances, uh, these images, than people who don't have vulnerabilities to them do. And my brain actually gets alarm bells going off in it in ways that the same exact phenomena, the same exact experience does not set off alarm bells in a person who doesn't have those vulnerabilities. Those kinds of awarenesses um, are the beginnings of the kinds of insights into the relationship between how your attention can be grabbed by your brain and the vulnerabilities that your brain is subject to with respect to substances and behaviors, images that allow a person to, at the very least, know what their vulnerabilities are and then, and then work to get into supportive environments, um, communities where they can get help um, managing these cravings, managing these kinds of ways their brain works, and, uh, and, and be proactive in that way and help themselves create circumstances that, that are conducive to dealing with these kinds of feelings and brain responses rather than ignoring them or making believe that I can just handle it when you know you basically can't or ignoring the fact that with respect to certain circumstances and substances your brain works differently than people who don't have these vulnerabilities. And so to conclude this first section the, 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 the basic story is Advances in science have allowed us to understand that some people have different kinds of vulnerabilities. They're, they have inherited propensities, predispositions to have their brain work differently with respect to different kinds of exposures to substances and images and situations where craving arises. And once one knows that, then it really does become extremely helpful, extremely productive, extremely conducive to having a life that is not miserable, a, a life that's not miserable and, 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 and a life in which you cause a lot of grief and suffering for yourself and people you care about, to acknowledge 
those vulnerabilities, seeing them in a biological way really does take a lot of the sort of the shame and I mean I think some of the more old-fashioned um, perspectives on these things which are now you know pretty out of style mostly for good for the good is that you know a person should just be able to control these things well the the uh, there's just just too much information now that says that a significant number of people and it's something around one in seven in the population just for alcohol and then and then and then the numbers you know you start adding to that the people who have other drug vulnerabilities sex uh, sexual behavior pornography vulnerabilities i mean the rough number is going to start to move up towards one in five people um that just in fact don't have the capacity to just control it and and need to use their mindful awareness their impartial spectator to take into account the fact that i have a greater